morning, good afternoon, good evening for the last time this uh, season. Teardrop. <laughs> My name is Karishma Pagani. Uh, thank you all for joining us for episode 12, um, the last episode in our season of the stories women carry. Um, for those of you that have been consistent followers, uh, you know the drill. We're going to have an hour of fun with um, our panelists today and, and uh, engage them in conversation. And for those of you that are joining for the first time today, um, this series essentially came about as we were reflecting about how to archive um, practices of creative practices of women across the continent in Africa. And for this second season, we really thought about how to include the diaspora um, in, in these conversations. Um, and so uh, this is this is what we'll be talking about today. Uh, I'd like to thank the HowlRound Theatre Commons for being wonderful, wonderful presenters and producers of this uh, series and for renewing it and for, its, for their constant support. Um, I'd like to thank the Arts Foundation and the Nairobi Musical Theatre Initiative for also co-producers and presenters of the series. Um, so yeah, they, you know, wouldn't have been possible without everybody's support. Um, I'm going to jump right in today to introduce our panelists, actually. It's a very, very exciting conversation and lots to learn. Um, Kathy, hi, how are you doing? Oh, I think you're on mute. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. I'm doing fine. I'm here in Durham, North Carolina. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really, really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to chat with us um, about your career and your journey and, and about um, Africa and the arts and in the global landscape. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, so why don't we dive in? I mean, uh, just to share, I usually like to share a little personal anecdote. So Kathy and I haven't ever really met in person. It's uh, uh, the, the joys of the pandemic, actually. Some of the good things that came out of the pandemic is that we could connect more um, well, much more over Zoom. And so Kathy and I met last year uh, through a virtual reading that we was hosted by the Tebere Arts Foundation of Tropical Fish. And we hit it off immediately and had really, really wonderful conversations um, about how to uh, collaborate on future projects. And you've been a, a constant source of inspiration for me as I've been doing my research. So thank you so much for being a resource and for being so available and welcome to, you know, welcoming me to talk with you over the last few, um, well, over the last year that we've known each other. Right, right. <laughs> no, and thank you for what you're doing with the festivals and um, introducing me to a lot of, you know, young up and coming writers. So that's, that's been one of the, the good things about this. So Such a pleasure. Yeah. And well, looking forward yeah. to seeing you here in the States. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah. Hopefully soon as uh, borders open up and visas are more available. I hope to be back uh, across the pond in the coming months. <laughs> Um, so actually, since you did mention young people, why don't we start off uh, with you telling us a little bit about your career journey? I mean, how did you get into the arts? How did you, um, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself and your interest in you and, and how you got into the arts. Well, I grew up in Mobile, Alabama. Um, I grew up during the civil rights movement, so it was a long time ago. <laughs> and I've always been interested in the arts. I mean, through church, through community organizations through, you know, school, you know, junior high, high school. And so, you know, I would mainly acting, acting and singing. I used to sing with a little group and stuff like that. Um, and so by the time it, I was ready to go to college, I just knew, you know, I was going to go into to theater. You know, there was, that was, you know, that was, there was no other option. That's what I really wanted to do. I was very passionate about the arts. And so I went to Howard University, which is an HBCU in Washington, DC, uh, which you know, had a- I'm huh? gonna interrupt you and ask if you could just clarify what an HBCU- uh, Oh, I'm CU sorry. HBCU, yeah, sorry. HBCU stands for Historically Black College University. Okay, we refer to them as HBCUs and, and Howard is one of the major HBCUs in the country, it's in Washington, D.C. It's where our vice president is from, Kamala Harris, you know, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. Um, so yeah, I went there, a fantastic theater program, and um, during my freshman year, which is true of a lot of theater programs, uh, you have to work on, you know, you have to do a course that's called practicum of some sort, which means you get to work in every aspect of theater, backstage, you know, everything. So I was doing stage crew. I was stage crew and lighting crew for this play by Alice Childress called Wine in the Wilderness. And a friend of mine who was a sophomore, we're still good friends, 
he was in communications lighting and we're just sitting backstage and out of the blue, he says, and this is 1973. He says, what are you gonna do with a BFA in acting? And I was sort of offended. And I said, what do you expect? I'm gonna go to Broadway, you know? And so he says, uh, you know, there are no roles for black women on Broadway. You know, you don't either play a mammy or a prostitute or whatever. And, and he said, I've, I've seen you hanging lights and focus and why don't you consider, you know, lighting? You know, we had a touring house on, on campus, which was right next door to our actual theater building. And he said, uh, you know, there's a lot of work going over there and we could always use people and why don't you think about it? So after I got over my boost ego, I took him up on his offer and then I started working there and, you know, the rest is history. He just sold me on it. And then I had advisors at the touring house as well as in my department who were extremely supportive of me going into lighting. And it wasn't rare. There were several black women in my department that were, were doing lighting. So it didn't seem any, it didn't seem unusual to me. Uh, but it was after I left Howard and went on to grad school that I was advised that, you know, black women in lighting was, was very, very rare. And these are the things that I would expect once I get out there and start working the, you know, discrimination, racism, sexism, you name it, all the isms I would encounter, which was true. So I left Howard, I went to University of Michigan to get my MFA in lighting. And after finishing there, I, I went straight to New York. I had a job in New York City with the dance company. Uh, I was there for six months and then another job came up um, that took me to Europe for, another, for like five months. And so, and I worked in New York, I came back and worked in New York and then I started teaching. But I've always been designing. I've always, I've never stopped designing lighting. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's it really, really interesting to hear you speak about your transition from your BFA in acting to a technical more production related uh, career. Yeah. I'd be curious to hear what your thoughts are on, on the landscape um, for women of color or for folks of color that are looking to get into technical work now um, would you say it's it's changed and become more accommodating and accessible for folks of color? Um, I think I think since the George Floyd um, incident, things are opening up more. And um, I, I go to USITT. USIT stands for United States Institute for Theater Technology, and I've been a member for about thirty years. And one of the things that I've um, and USITT is basically universities, colleges, some professional theater companies, um, businesses, you know, be it lighting, sound, costume, or whatever. And so one of the things that I've been advocating there, you know, since I've been going is that people admit, you know, recruit more students of color, you know. Um, so it shouldn't just have to be me because I was at University of Illinois for 22 years where I ran the lighting program. And so because I was there, I made sure I had students of color, not just from the US, but from all over the world. I had students from Africa, I had students from, um, from uh, Korea, China, you know, you name it, South America, Trinidad, whatever. I made sure it was an extremely diverse program. And so one of the things I did, I encouraged many of my colleagues to do the same. Some of them took me up on it. And so that has helped. Um, and usually when I go to some of the HBCUs, I encourage the departments like, you know, we have to develop more people behind the scenes. Um, so yeah, and then I also try and encourage some theater companies to, you know, with your internships, hear people you can use, hear schools you can go to. So I think the numbers have, the numbers have definitely grown. You know, you, we're definitely seeing a larger pool of uh, particularly Blacks. Um, and I just think, well, and I hate the term BIPOC, I'm sorry. I just use global majority. Global majority students across the board. Um, I have a, a black Facebook page, it's called you know, Black Stage Designers, and which I've had for about 12 years and it's really grown. And I'm just looking at the number of young blacks who are getting degrees. And, and the, the whole point of the Facebook page was to mentor, nurture and, you know, uh, and it's also professional. So I have, you know, it's a range of people, you know, people who are in undergrad, grad school, who have been working, you know, on Broadway or whatever in film and stuff like that, mainly theater. So it's a way for us to network. It's a way for people to encourage other people. We'll look at portfolios. 
Um, now there are a couple of students who are just finishing up their MFAs and they're saying, oh, uh, here's my portfolio review. Can you sign up to give me feedback? So, and it's just for people to see what shows are going on. You know, I have a show going on and I encourage people, if you're working on a project, if it's someone in your area, you know, have that young person come in and, and see you hang in focus or go in the costume shop. So I know that was a long answer, <laughs> no, I mean, but, the, really, but the numbers has, are growing, you know, particularly compared to when I was coming out of school. Right. Know. I mean, it's really inspiring to hear your approach towards this as well, uh, because last week we had uh, Dr. Ndunu on, uh, in, in conversation um, on this panel, and she, start, she was talking about her work with the Create Ensemble and the Craft Institute. One of the things she mentioned was creating this platform online um, similar to your Facebook group, but she sort of created it on her own website uh, for young professionals to be able to seek mentorship, but then also to create platforms to uh, market themselves and market their service and their work um, across the performing arts, but uh, various other disciplines as well. So um, just really interesting to see how there are various movements, there are various connections and networking opportunities that have sort of presented themselves uh, now for young professionals of color across yeah. the US and around the world, actually. Right. Um, I was an, uh, an education apprentice at the Roundabout Theatre Company in 2019, and one of the most inspiring programs that came out of there that I, I was fascinated with was a theatrical workforce development program where technical um, uh, theatre practitioners are given two to three years of a fellowship to uh, hone their craft mm -hmm. and then actually be able to work within uh, uh, New York City, you know, theatre uh, performances and shows. And so, yeah, it's really it's really wonderful to see programs like this coming up. Um, I actually want to pivot back to one of the things that you mentioned about the classes that you taught that had, you know, diversity and, and the global majority, uh, you know, be a, you know part of the student population that you taught. What was that experience like for you as a teacher? How did you navigate the differences? How did you um, craft a syllabus that was universally accessible to students coming from what I assume are different walks of life and different cultural experiences as well? Right. Okay. Let me go. Okay. It's two different things. The students that I was saying that I brought from all over the world. These were students that came into the MFA lighting program. Uh -huh, okay, These okay. were specifically students, you know, and it, it's really interesting because um, when I got to Illinois in 89, the MFA lighting program had been dormant. And so they had called me to come and reinstate the program. And I had been at Smith College for, for six years teaching. And then I left for five years and I just said, I'm done with academia. And when they called me about it, I said, no, and then after I thought about it, I said, wow, if I, go, if I go and run this program, I decide who comes into the program. And I knew there was a, a paucity of, of people of color in these graduate programs. So that gave me an opportunity to bring in, you know, like I said, young people from all over, all over the world. So I usually had about six grad students at one time. And not only did I just bring in lighting people, but I made sure there were people coming in in costume and scene design um, uh, stage management um, and acting, you know, I, it's like we, we can partner with a certain number of HBCUs. What we did, we partnered with um, Howard, Spelman, Morehouse, North Carolina a and and one or two other schools uh, to make sure we had, you know, black students coming in. And I, I didn't have a problem with students coming from Asia because there was always tons and tons of uh, uh, applications. Um, but the students that I brought from Africa, these were usually students that I met while I was over there. Um, and they, you know, they didn't have the portfolio like the students here because they don't have the resources. They have Vector Works and AutoCAD and all that stuff. But they came and they were amazing students. Now I did teach a course on non-Western theater um, and that was pretty much for grad students or upper um, undergrads. And that was one of my most, um, rewarding courses because we looked at theater primarily from places that I had been, that I traveled to. So I was always speaking from my experiences. Um, like we did a whole section, maybe one semester we did a whole section just on Japanese theater. At the time I hadn't gone to Japan, but when I was in LA, I worked four years for the Japan American Theater <laughs> Center. And, uh, and, you know, it was just a mind blowing experience because Back in the 80s, you know, Japan was like the powerhouse in terms of capitalism. And so every major 
company from Japan, Boon Raku, you know, everything was coming from there. No drama. So I had access, exposure to all this. Um, and so I was able to teach that in the different places in Africa that I'd gone to, you know, I could teach South African theater. I'd been to the Caribbean. I could talk about carnival. Um, and so I was bringing in, you know, real, you know, experiences that I had, you know, so I could have video, video footage of certain events, not something we saw on, you know, PBS or whatever. It's like, you know, this was my experience. Here's the artist. And the other beautiful thing was that, um, see, I was on Zoom or Skype way before the pandemic. I would say about 12 years ago, I was Skyping in people, you know, you know, here's an artist from Ghana, you know, here's an artist from um, from Egypt or whatever, they're gonna, they're gonna join us for class today. And that was always exciting for the student, for them to actually see that. Um, yeah. um, I would love to learn more about uh, your travels across the continent. How did you become interested in African art and theater making? And uh, what did your travels, I know it's a vague question, what, did you, some of, what are some of your experiences from your travels? Uh, and what did that reveal to you about the arts on the continent? Okay, let me go back, let me go way, way back. Um, <laughs> Tell us a story. Know, African theater was really never on my radar. It was when I was in New York, right out of, out of grad school, 1978. I, I lived with my sister, we lived in New Jersey. She was working in New Jersey and I was working in New York. And this is 78 and this was still doing the height of apartheid. And so she had some students at her university uh, from South Africa, they were exiled journalists and writers. And so she would have them over for dinner. And, you know, I would meet them and they started talking about that they were doing theater in the city, in Brooklyn, and they were all over, all over the place. And so I started working with them. Um, and uh, it, it was just an amazing time for me because they would call and say, we need some lighting and we don't have any money. Can you come and light our show? And, you know, I would work with them in between my other jobs. And then even when I went to Smith College, I was, you know, the whole time I was on the East Coast in the 80s, I would do shows with them. But what, what really dawned on me at the time, because at that point I was beginning my research mainly on uh, Black women, playwrights and stuff like that. And um, I noticed every show that I worked on, and again, these were basic, basically South African pieces. They were by men, about men, everything was done by the men. You know, I was usually the only woman working on the, on the, you know, on the production team. And, you know, that sort of struck me. I'd be watching these shows. It's like, don't women have something to say about, you know, there are no theater women or whatever. And then when I went to the, moved to the West Coast in the late, in the mid eighties, um, I, I continued to keep up my interest in Africa, you know, because it was apartheid. I was interested in what was going on with Mandela and, um, um, so, and I guess in 1995, this is much years, much later. Well, 94, Mandela became president. Uh, 95, I was on leave, it was just really weird. I was on leave in 94, 95, working on a project. And I had accrued all these frequent flyer miles from American Airlines. And, uh, and I was just sitting there saying to myself, I've got all these miles, I wanna go somewhere. I don't know, I need to go someplace far. And I'm one of these people, I always get signs that this is what you need, this is what is supposed to happen. So one day I, I opened a New York Times magazine, the New York Times paper, the travel section. There's this huge two page ad that says, South Africa is waiting for you. And American Airlines had um, teamed up with South Africa because South Africa was, you know, was coming back to the US. And they were trying to get people from the US to travel to South Africa. So they had this amazing deal where with virtually little to no frequent flyer miles, I could fly to South Africa business class. But yes, but I had to book my ticket with I wish, that was, I wish that was a reality now. I really do. I wish like a post-COVID uh, airline marketing strategy is two miles and you can I know it's class. like it was like really I can fly business class I'd never flown business class in my life and it's like but you have to book within two within two weeks and you know either to Johannesburg or Cape Town and I just booked a ticket I had no idea where I was going I didn't know anybody in South Africa but I'd never been to the continent I said this is supposed to happen so I just booked a ticket 
And I just started telling people, oh, hey, I'm going to South Africa in June. And, uh, and then things just fell into place. It's like, oh, so-and-so, one of your colleagues is the Fulbright. She's in Johannesburg. You have a place to stay. Oh, someone who used to teach with me is in Cape in uh, Durban. And so I just ended up, you know, by the time I got to South Africa, I had places to stay. Um, and then a friend who knew somebody through the State Department arranged me to go to all these different places around South Africa and do workshops, do lighting workshops, talk about theater in America. Uh, and again, you have to realize during this time, the world had been shut off from South Africa been shut off from the world. So they didn't really know what was happening around the world, particularly in America. You know, they would hear things. TV was still new in South Africa for a long time, it was banned. So we're talking about 1995, very few people had television. So they didn't really know what was going on. And so that was wonderful. So I was there for like three, three weeks that time. And uh, during the time I was there, um, I, the very first night I was there, someone told me that I had to go to this women's bar called Kippy's. It, it doesn't exist anymore. Why, have you heard of Kippy's? You're smiling. No, I, just the concept itself is fascinating. Actually. Oh, it was, yeah, it was, I mean, the, the third Wednesday of each month, it was all women's night. And so, of course, I arrived in the town the Wednesday of that, <laughs> that third Wednesday. And so people said, you have to go. It's like, uh, I just had a 16 hour flight or a 12 hour flight. It's like, I'm tired. No, you must go. So it was amazing. And so, you know, women were talking about the issues post-apartheid and we talked about women writers and I was discovering that it was difficult for South African women to get their works uh, published. So, so that was, that was a very, um, um, it was a very exciting time. I got to see a lot of theater. It was, it was a whirlwind trip. Um, and then I came back the following year. I was asked to come back the following year um, well, the first time I went over, I, I did not go over with the intentions of, I'm going to do a collection of plays by South African women. I, I just went over because I'd never gone to Africa. Um, I just read so much about South Africa. And I said, well, this would be the place to start. Uh, plus they speak English. Um, so I went back the next year. I was invited to come back because they had just appointed a black South African as artistic director of one of the theaters. Because at the time in South Africa, all the theaters were run by the state. Very well-funded theater, state-of-the-art everything. So they assigned this guy to the smaller of the state theaters in Johannesburg. And when it was discovered that a black man would be in charge, all the staff left. The staff was white. Uh, and again, we're talking about at this time, there was no training for blacks in technical theater or anything behind the stage. So they had no staff. So what they did, they said, oh, since you do lighting, would you be willing to come back next summer and teach lighting to you know these young people, teach stage management, which is not my area, but I could teach basic stage management and do some sound and then we'll do a big show at the end of the summer. So I went back for that. And while I was there those three months, it gave me an opportunity to meet a lot of women playwrights, a lot of women writers. Um, and that's when the idea came about, oh, why don't I do a collection of plays about South, by South African women? It wasn't all women. Some of the writers were men because they wrote, I, I felt some incredible plays about South African women. So that's where this, that started. So I began to work on the collection of plays my first summer, and then I went back the next summer. I mean, the book came out in 99. So I worked on it for like four years. Wonderful. And, and of course, I, it, you know, it goes by no surprise that the, that the anthology African Women Playwrights as well, um, uh, you know, is one that you collected. So I'd love to hear how, how, how that came about as well. Okay, that one took about 10, wait, from 95. That came out in right. 2009, I think. Yeah, 2009. Right. So what so was that was, like? What, what, what sparked the, the um, decision to come up with this or, or compile a second anthology that covered the continent? Um, and was it related at all to your experience in South Africa? What it was, was related to my experiences in South Africa because once I started going to South Africa, it's really strange how this, things would just start snowballing. Oh, you're in South Africa. Oh. I have a friend in Zimbabwe. Why don't you come to Zimbabwe? And so while I'm there, I'm looking at the women in theater and there's, you know, there's the Zimbabwe 
Women's Writers Association, which I'm sure you're aware of. Um, so, you know, they were talking about the difficulty of getting plays, well, published. It's just publication is a big issue. And then, you know, then I ended up going to Uganda because I had a friend who was staying there. She was on a full of rights, like, oh, come to Uganda. And he's like, and you need to meet so-and-so. Uh, and I just began to see that it was a real problem. And that's when I met Goretti in 97 or 98. And she talked about that issue. And I, I was so impressed with Goretti, uh, Goretti Chomo Munde. I always screw up her last name. Um, because they had started this group called FemRight in Uganda. And it was like one of the first women's publishing organization on the continent. I'm pretty sure they were the first one because they inspired so many women. And she was saying, because we can't get our works published, we have to do this ourselves. They had gotten this huge grant. And so that sort of sparked my interest in, okay, why don't I put together a collection of plays by women across the continent? Um, um, one, because there wasn't, there wasn't an anthology available. I was shocked. It's like, there's no collection of plays on African women. And I also wanted to teach these in my class. So, you know, I would get a play from this person and a play from this playwright. Um, but, you know, there was never one collection. And so that's what I, that's, that's yeah, I, I started doing that. And then I just started going to other parts of Africa. Uh, no, mainly think, Anglophone speaking countries, because I don't speak anything else. Right. Well, I think you, you just in sharing um, the sort of transition or the move move from the South African women playwrights anthology to the African women playwrights, um, I think you've highlighted two issues that I think continue to plague us and trouble us as a continent, right? One, in, in, in terms of visibility, one is this sort of vast difference of language where Anglophone speaking countries generally um, have a separate sort of world in which they function in the Francophone speaking countries and in the MENA region, which is oftentimes not even considered part of the continent sometimes, just creates this really big rift just amongst us as people on the continent, let alone, you know, in, in a global landscape. Um, and then, and, and so you brought up um, really interestingly that the question of language and the disparity of language and what that means in terms of accessibility and also how Anglophone speaking and Francophone speaking countries still continue to maintain this sort of neo-colonial relationship with, with their former colonizers through the language that is being spoken, right? What can be said of our traditional languages and ethnic, you know, traditions, um, storytelling in, in those uh, worlds and how can that be presented on the global landscape? Um, and of course, the other thing that you brought up is, is this idea that publishing and written work is still so, uh, uh, is much more, considered much more uh, of archival form of tradition than oral storytelling is, for example, which I think largely, you know, we, we focus on on the continent. Um, one of our previous guests, Sheba Hurst, who was part of uh, our first season, really interestingly, in one of my conversations with her had said uh, that the things that are remembered, the plays that are remembered about from Kenya are the ones that were published, nothing else. And yet in the 80s and 90s, there was, there was so much work coming out of the region, but because it didn't necessarily have that kind of platform, um, it, it didn't really you know, take flight in the same way that the works like Betrayal in the City, for example, did, or right. Uganda work, for example. Um, so this is more of a philosophical question for you. I'd be curious to hear, given your experience on the continent and given your experience in teaching in the US across uh, you know, various different universities and different courses, what would you say is the next step for young and emerging and established playwrights on the continent, for example, um, who, and artists actually who are interested in, in having their work um, seen by a global audience? Well, you know, and again, I hate to keep saying this, you know, there've been some good things that have come out of the pandemic. And because of the pandemic, um, like I said, I've connected with a lot of different African women writers. Uh, uh, they've had a larger platform because we're on Zoom. You know, I, I got to see something, well, one, you're reading <laughs> um, of- um, Yeah, you know, Tropical Fish. Yeah, Doreen, Doreen's piece. I wouldn't have been able to see that had it not been for you. Uh, Doreen is this amazing writer from Uganda. And I met her when I was in Uganda in 2018, a friend of mine, a mutual friend of mine gave me a copy of her book. And I just read her story. It's like, these should be staged. 
you know, this should really be staged. And then I can't remember how we connected, if it was through Doreen or whatever, that she said, oh, you know, Karishma, they're gonna do one of my um, short stories for the stage. And uh, in fact, I'm publishing one of Doreen's stories. She adapted for this new book I have that's coming out. But uh, so I think the internet is going to be one way festivals. I mean, one of the ways that I have promoted the work of African women, one through publishing, but that's just not enough, um, but by trying to have festivals. In 2010, when I was at the University of Illinois, I had a festival. It was called, you know, African Women Writers. Uh, it wasn't just playwrights, but it was women writers across the board. And it was wonderful because I was able to bring African women from across the continent who had never met each other. And, and I never thought about that. One of the things they were so grateful for, they were saying, it's so rare that you have a large number of African women coming together in the US or outside of the US, you know, uh, at someone else's expense. Um, and, and we get to meet, it's usually like we'll bring one or two people or, or something like that. And so that was very rewarding. It was like oh, an eight day event and then, in 2016, when I came to University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, I did a much larger festival, but this was women from Africa and the diaspora. So that was one way of introducing their work. And one of the other things I tried to do is more, I was more successful in 2010 and 2016. When I bring these women to the continent, to the US, I try and make sure they can go elsewhere. You know, this is a long ways to come for like four or five days. Uh, I made sure the festival continued in Chicago. A colleague of mine, Sandra Richards, who does African um, um, theater as well, she worked it out where we could bring them to Northwestern. And then there was Columbia College. We, you know, some of the women went there. And then I have a sister who teaches out in California, a women's studies program. She took some of the women there. One of the women went to Dartmouth, somebody went to New York. So it's about, you know, creating these networks. You know, the biggest expense is getting them here and getting the visas and stuff. But once they're here, it's like, oh, it's only $300 to fly them. Okay, I can, you know, bring them and, you know, pay them and put them up. So we have to create these networks and things. And the other thing that I try and do, if there is an artist in the country, and that's, that's the disadvantage of not being an academia anymore. I don't have access to the funding. If there's an artist in the country, I will bring them. Uh, you probably know Adong Judith from Uganda, uh, a student of mine was working with her at the National Black Theater in New York. And she said, oh my God, there's this amazing Ugandan playwright that you should meet. And so we connected and I, we read one of her plays, it was called God. And I had a very diverse class with my class on African women in theater, an extremely diverse class it was like 18 kids. It was like, you know, Asian Americans, uh, I had some African students in there, African Americans, white, you name it. it was a, and I said, okay, we're gonna read this play. It was a comedy and it was something they could relate to. And I said, we're gonna all be Ugandans <laughs> for the next two weeks. And they loved it. And they learned a lot about Uganda because I remember one student says, well, where's Uganda? How do you spell it? It's like, so by the end, this, this young person had, you know, had read so much about Uganda and we brought Judith to to be with us like a, a student of mine a former student came in to direct the students so they had a professional director working with them and then judith came for like the last four days and worked with the students you know sharing the culture you know this is how you pronounce this word this is what this food meant and it was such a it was a wonderful experience and we did a public reading of it um so so those are ways and then, like i said i bring people to campus like i brought Cece Dingarimba, she was at Michigan. So it's like, oh, she's in the country. It's like, oh, okay, well, we'll bring it to Illinois. So we have to create that network, you know. Right, right. And again, you know, just so commendable and so forward thinking of you to be Skyping people in 10, 12 years ago, even in your classes to be able to bridge, you know, the continents together uh, and really uh, expose students and expose young people to uh, the, the plethora of work that is present. Um, mm -hmm. You, you brought up something really interesting uh, when you were talking about your African Women Writers uh, uh, Festival, that it was not just playwrights. Um, could you speak a little bit more about that decision? Why, why wasn't it specifically playwrights um, 
uh, what is that, you know, do you have anything to say about the nature of the work that you've seen across the continent and its relevance to what we would consider traditional theater across the globe? Right, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the poster. <laughs> okay. I mean, actually, <laughs> most, uh, most of the women were in theater. And um, I, I use writers because, and it's really interesting. I've, I've done away with the word playwrights when I'm, I'm dealing with women outside of, you know, Western traditions. And right right now, I, I have a, a book that's an anthology that's coming out. It's, it's around the theme of home. And home can be anything you want it to be or whatever. And so I started, I wanted to, first I, I, I called it um, international plays by, by and about women. And then I realized a lot of these, in certain countries, women don't write plays in the, in the Western sense. And so I said, I'm just gonna call them um, performance pieces. Okay, because that's always been, it's been difficult for me to, when I start saying playwrights, I have a difficult time finding people. But then when I say storytellers who can, can perform their pieces, then I get people coming out of the woodwork. So I've, I've done away with the term playwright because just to give you an example, years and years ago, I did a collection of plays that I co-edited with a friend. Uh, it was called Contemporary Plays by Women of Color. And we had Native American women um, or indigenous women writing. And they don't write plays in the Western tradition because you know they were like driving me crazy. And now I, I, I apologize to them like five years later. It's like, you know, that was like 25 years ago. Why are you even worried about this? Like, and I said, you know, I was forcing you to write in a way that you're not accustomed to. That's not how you present your work. Because I was saying, well, I need the full text. I need stage direction. Well, I only have my version of the script. You know, I only need to know my lines. And she has it. It's like, well, we got to put it all together into one play. So I, I realized I was forcing them to do something that they, you know, they don't operate that way. Uh, and so with this new text coming out, I just got rid of the word uh, playwright because that was becoming a problem for Doreen because I was stressing Doreen now. She says, I need to put stage direction. I need to have a right. climax and I need to have this heightened right. light. I said, no, let's just, just do it as a story. Yeah. And let's just leave yeah. it at that. And then I have these women from India who are of African descent. You know, they're storytellers. And it's like, I'm thinking, I'm trying to make them be playwrights. That's not what they are. They're playmakers. So that's what I've, what, that's what I've been doing. And so when I said writers, I, I consciously said writers uh, because some of these women were not traditional playwrights. You probably know Hope Azita uh, from Rwanda. I don't think she calls herself a playwright. I think she calls herself a playmaker, but she's a writer. Right. Um, and there were some other people I brought in. Um, Amadina Lahamba, um, she's not a play, well, she does, you know, she's a writer. So I wanted her to come, but most of the women were, they were tied to theater. They were basically in the theater. Right. I didn't want to say playwrights. Right, uh, just in that own sense of its word, what I hear you saying that is that it's quite restrictive. Even it's in terms very of, restricted, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of our previous panelists from our first season as well, Alea, has a really interesting way of saying the idea that the, the novel, the idea of no, the novel coming to the African continent was a form of colonization because it restricted us to thinking about storytelling as a one track, beginning, middle, end thing. Yes. As Africans, this is not how we tell stories. Um, and it's also a very broad generalization to say, as Africans, this is how we don't tell stories because everybody has their own method of communication you know, right. from one generation to the other, whether it's through oral practice or through song and dance. Um, and, you know, what, this is one of the things that comes up for us at the Musical Theatre Initiative a lot, right? Because we're talking about musical theatre as a form, but the way that it exists on the continent is a completely different, you know, has a completely different dramaturgical evolution to it, right? And it's yeah. not, the same, not the same thing as what we would imagine traditional American musical theatre to look like in this context. Right. Um, so, so when I, I when I do these out. anthologies, I have to, you know, I have to stop thinking, you know, in the, like the Western way of, you know, this is the only way you can do it. And I have to be more open. And so that's, that's what I've been doing. And that way I've been getting more works from people. You right. know, because when I start saying play, it's like, well, we don't really have any playwrights. We have some theater people or storytellers who perform right. like, okay. So. Oh, 
also with the pandemic at this moment, the idea of also theater existing, you know, in its own form in the same way that it did before the pandemic is, is hard to imagine because the influence of technology, the influence of Zoom, um, all of these factors are going to play such a, a big role in shifting and crafting what the genre is going to look like because yeah. all of a sudden theater and film are in this murky territory together. Um, a same way one of our previous panelists as well said uh, how she thinks that Zoom plays are going to become a whole genre and there's going to be a whole course that's going to be taught about how to direct and how to write Zoom plays, you know, uh, to be able to bring people from around the world to participate in the same way. And, and I think that's good because one of the other things I've been thinking about was, you know, if I can get a grant from somebody, if somebody out there listening who has a million dollars, can I have half of it? Uh, I would Hope love to have, do We have million dollar people listening to this conversation. Oh, okay. Ahead. Well, can I get a million or two? <laughs> um, but I would love to do, you know, an online thing, mainly, you know, small pieces, one and two character pieces. Um, but, you know, I never want to give up live theater. There's nothing can replace live theater. But at least people would have access to a platform. Um, you know, I, I would love to do that as a way of introducing. Um, I mean, there may be something out there already. I don't know. It's, it's so much going on right now. Yeah, um, I'd love to. It'd be great. Um, I mean, may I recommend for our audience members that are tuned in today and also for you, if you haven't heard of Theatre for One already, it might be interesting. for One? Theatre, Theatre for One. Oh, wow. um, Might be an interesting thing for you all to check out. Um, it's uh, produced by Octopus Theatricals and it's a... Uh, well, I hosted on a website at this moment, but it's a series of uh, one one person monologue, one person shows performed for one audience member over a technological platform. Oh, so they did that at Victory. I mean, um, somebody in Chicago was doing that, where only mm -hmm. one person is there with the person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, yes. So it's similar. So um, yeah, it's just one example of a lot of the work that is going on at this moment outside there. But uh, I, I love your idea and I think there's so many you know different avenues to explore uh, when it comes to generating this kind of con content that can bring people together from around the world. Right and then there's Yvette Hutchinson I'm sure you're familiar with her platform African Women I think it's just called African Women Theatre Platform. I don't think they do productions only I think it's mainly a resource for where shows are being done and it's a way to connect African women writers so um, I mean, she may be expanding to that, but you know, I would love to see something like that, just so you can, we can expose the work of these women. And 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 getting back to and you know, just stop me if I'm getting off track. One of the things that I was very concerned about, um, this was when I went to South Africa. Um, like I said, I didn't go there with the intent of wanting to do a collection of plays, but you know, when I began talking to some of the women about, by then I had done my first collection of plays, it was called you know. Uh, early black women playwrights and he said why don't you do something like that for us and I just said oh okay um and then I was nervous about it because I started going to people and you know I'm very sensitive to you know going up black during the civil rights era you know white people coming into our community and say well we're going to write all about you and so even though I'm a black woman I'm not a South African woman and so my concern was are you comfortable with an outsider coming in, trying to tell your story. But in the, the way the anthology is, is um, designed, it's, it's I'm letting them tell their own story. You know, I give a brief introduction, but I let each person tell their story. So I said, are you comfortable with an outsider coming in, you know, publishing this book? And the, the thing that everybody kept saying to me is like, if you don't publish it, we won't get published. Because they were saying the only time people get to see our work as if someone from the West comes and publish the work. And, and most of the time they don't even have access to the book, which was, I found really interesting, but it was very clear. When I went to Germany, I can't think of the guy's name. Um, I went into a German, a friend took me into this German bookstore. Their theater shelf had all of these plays by African writers, all the publications were in Europe, and, and another young woman who said that, she said, when I went to France, I found more plays by, you know, Francophone Africans than I could in my own country of Cameroon or whatever. <clears throat> so the plays are published, they're published outside. And so yeah. when I published Black South African um, uh, playwrights, I was very, very conscious of that. And so 
Routledge, which was my publisher, we teamed up. I said, can we team up with somebody in South Africa so we can make the book accessible? Because, you know, a book in the U.S. at $30, you know, that's hundreds of rand in South Africa. So Cape Town, University of Cape Town, they co-partnered with um, Routledge out of London so they could publish the book in South Africa and make it, you know, accessible for people to buy. Um, and so, you know, so that yeah. would be important to me. Um, I mean, just, just to add on to that, one of the other challenges that we're think, you know, facing, you know, as, as a producer here, as I think about the creative exchanges, as I think about platforms and festivals across the continent, one of the biggest struggles we face is being able to see our own work and, and, and similarly be able to see our own work being published that can be presented in our own context. Right. Um, in many ways, arguably, this is some form of brain drain, right? Where somebody or a group of folks from abroad are able, because of the resources that they have, able to produce this kind of work and, and, and uh, publish it for use in their countries. But we're not necessarily able to reap the benefit of that intellectual property. Um, and so, just hearing you speak about how you develop that sustainable relationship between University of Cape Town and Routledge to be able to uh, ensure that the work is accessible on the continent, which is where it's coming from, and then abroad, um, is a really interesting model to think about uh, adopting for those that are you know, interested in that kind of publishing, because a large part of the uh, challenge at this moment as well on the continent, I, or I can speak to Kenya specifically as well, is that we don't necessarily have the kind of resources that Routledge would to be able to publish. That being said, we do have wonderful publishers like Jahazi is a wonderful, uh, Traweza Communications is a wonderful example in Kenya specifically of a publishing house that is focused on arts and culture from both the research perspective, but also uh, a publisher that um, focuses on publishing creative work. Right, right. The other thing, um, and, and again, this was something else, a lot of things came up out of the, the, the publication of the African women. Um, and I don't remember if it was Dr. Lahamba that brought it to my attention or somebody else. Um, they were concerned about, um, usually when African women are published, which is few of them, they are always African women who live abroad, you know, not those that are on the continent. Oh, and I think I had this conversation with Ahmad I do because, uh, for those of you who don't know who Amara Adu is, she's from Ghana, or she is from Ghana, and she was the first African woman to publish a play in English in, in the 1960s. And she hates to hear that she was the first African woman. The but Dilemma it, of a Ghost, right? The Dilemma of a Ghost, right. And, and, and I published that because when I first thought about the collection of plays, it's like, let me do all new women. I said, no, we need to know who Amara Adu is and Cece Dingaremba and all of those people. And so one of the things that came up is that um, and it may have been Goretti, you know, she may have said, well, it'd be nice if you just published African women who live here, not those who've been in the U.S. and the U.K. for 30, 40 years, you know, who don't really know what's going on over here. <laughs> so, and so I made a conscious decision to do that. I just had one woman from the Cameroon and only because I wanted something from a, a, um, a Francophone country. Um, she lived, she was, yeah, here in the, in the U.S. and she's still here. And even though Ahmad Adu was teaching at Brown, but you know, she was here six months and she went back to Ghana six months and now she's retired, she's in Ghana. So I said, I really want women who are on the continent and they all appreciated that. So when the book came out, it's like, why don't you have so-and-so in the book? And it's like, well, she's been in the US for 30 years. So-and-so has been in Australia for 30 years. I want people, I want women who are on the continent. Those we don't really hear that much about. So it was a very conscious decision. And so this collection of um, performance pieces I have now, I'm very conscious of the women who live on the continent, you know, because so yeah. much is changing on the continent, you know. Yeah, um, I'd love to hear more about, um, or more so for our audience as well, uh, you know, which countries uh, you focused on for this new project that you're working on. I wrote it down because I knew you were going to ask me. <laughs> Originally, and, and this is sort of a takeoff on the last festival I did called Telling Our Stories of Home, Women from Africa and the Diaspora. And so during the lockdown, I decided I wanted to do a collection of, of plays, which, which I came, decided to call them performance pieces. Originally, I was going to just do women from the diaspora. Then I said, oh, I'm trying to think as a publisher, you know, publishers are struggling. 
It's like, I think something more international would have a, a wider appeal. But I have 11, I have 11 writers, um, nine from nine different countries. The countries are, are uh, it's, I have Haiti, I have Brazil, it's one man, but he has this amazing play about a woman. Um, I have Haiti, Brazil, uh, two, three from the US, three writers from the US, someone from the UK, someone from Uganda, India, Palestine, Venezuela, and Lebanon. Uh, but two thirds of the writers, I would say, represent the African diaspora. And I would say the women from Palestine, Lebanon, and Venezuela uh, don't. And then I have one uh, Asian American from the US. But I would say the majority of the women represent the African diaspora. Even the women from India, these are cities. People may have heard of them before. These are Africans who were brought to India as slaves or they came as um, soldiers almost 600, 800, 700 years ago. And it's like India's you know, best kept secret. A lot of people don't even know anything about them. So I wanted stories of them, you know, them being in India, not feeling like it's home, you know, them being perceived as Africans in a negative way, but they've never been to Africa. All they know is India. So they have a wonderful story to tell. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. I mean, as a South Asian Kenyan who's been here, you know, for five generations, I think this was one of the conversations we were having early on when we first connected. Um, just about the African presence of Africans in India and what that what cultural assimilation looks like in that context and right. the similar struggle in this context for us where we came as indentured laborers or as workers for the for the railway and have to sort of build our own lives here as well and, and just understanding and assessing those differences always uh, brings up a lot of complications when it comes to you know diversity and, 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 and assim assimilation on both the Indian subcontinent and in East Africa. Um, actually, uh, there's very there's very cool festival that used to happen called the Samosa Festival in Nairobi that aimed right. to bring um, Asians and Africans on the continent or in the region together uh, to, to be able to share and celebrate culture that is has been created as a result of coming together of these two communities. Sure. Um, I think Zarina, Zarina Patel and Zahid Rajan, the two board members, um, and they have, you know, a wonderful journal as well called Awaz that highlights some of these uh, stories of assimilation. So, um, yeah, and, and they brought the city Gomas together, I think in 2010 in their festival, they brought the city Gomas to perform um, in, in, I think it happened in Nairobi at the time. That's interesting as you speak about identity. When I first went to South Africa, um, and or maybe it was in the next year when I started looking for it. I said, I'm looking for, you know, uh, black women playwrights or, and then I decided I would just, I would use black men who write about black women. And then people started taking me to South Africans of Indian descent. And it's like, oh, I said, I was looking for black <laughs> South Africans. And so that whole thing about what black men, and again, this is 95. It wasn't like we're, they're saying, well, we're African, African people. It was more of a political identity, I, I assume, because I remember asking somebody that. It's like, well, I, you know, well, we have a whole different definition of Black in the U.S. So, uh, so I, I thought that was interesting. And I had to define it in the, in the anthology when I said, oh, okay, this person is of Indian descent, right. but they identify as Black, um, which is really interesting. So. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's present across the entire East Coast, you know, even in the West, actually, uh, you know, on the continent. There's very interesting studies in uh, of Nigeria as well, uh, when it comes to the question of assimilation of the of, of Indians, you know, coming from the subcontinent who've been there for very many generations, what mm -hmm. that means, what blackness means in that context, what it means to be African in this day and age, right? Um, and how, how to articulate that you know in the correct language um you know not only to be politically correct but also just to, to recognize and highlight some of these um well these diversity across the continent as well right 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 yeah. so i i brought a, a young man or oh, i guess the late 90s uh, from south africa you know he sort of identified as black but he was south african but he was also indian and you know here in the u.s well back then the boxes were small you either black white you know, yes. Hispanic or whatever. So it's like, well, what am I supposed to? I was driving the administrator crazy. Well, what is he? How do we, what do we check him out? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 
He's South African, you know, he's African. But is he white or is he black? <laughs> I still struggle with that to date, actually. I was filling out a couple of forms and there was a question of, are you Asian? Are you African? Are you black? Are you like, where do you fit in, right? And there's a little bit of everything because the way we understand Asian is to understand East Asian, which is not me, but the way we understand South Indian is also not the same. So yeah, there's a big, big question of identity politics there. I think is present in our work as well. Um, and, and, and it's just really interesting complexity there. Oh yeah, I'm sure it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, we could keep talking for hours and hours on end, but unfortunately we have a, a limit on time. And uh, okay. I'm so sad to have to end our conversation because I had so many other questions, but I guess I'll end on one note. And I like to ask this question of our panelists, just for our young people that may be tuned in. Um, what's the one piece of advice that you'd have for a young person looking to enter the arts? Um, this is just advice in general. You know, if you're passionate about something, you know, go for it. Don't be afraid of the word no. Don't be afraid to fail. I, I don't know, I think this is a generation. They're so afraid of making mistakes. They're so afraid of failing. You know, if, if, you, know, if you fail, you know, just pick yourself up and just move on. And, you know, don't be afraid of the word no. You know, I, I grew up hearing no all my life. You know? um, but for me, no makes me stronger. When someone tells me no, that means, okay, there's something better out there for me. Or if someone slams the door in my face, I go out and build my own. Um, so you just have to be, you know, persistent if this is something you really want to do. And, you know, don't be afraid to take chances. Like I said, I always get a sign, you know, looking at, you know, American Airlines saying, come to South Africa. It's like, oh, I'm just going to get a ticket. Not knowing what the hell I was going to do, where I was going to go. So sometimes you have to just follow your instinct and, and, and do things. And a lot of times goals that you set for yourself, that may not be what you're supposed to be doing. Like I thought I was gonna be the next, I don't know, Angela Bassett or whatever, Felicia Rashad. And I don't think, thank God, I don't know what I'd be doing if, if I'd stayed in acting. Uh, so, you know, something else, another door opened and said, this is probably what you should be doing. And I took a chance and I did that. And if you're a, theater, a person in tech theater, you'll never starve. You know, you'll all, there's always work for people in the technical areas of theater, you know. But, you know, don't be afraid to follow your instinct. You know, you know failure's gonna be there. Don't be afraid of knowing. If it's passionate, you're passionate about something, you know, follow through on it, but always have a backup plan. Because you know? <laughs> I'm thinking about a lot of theater artists like, I only know how to do this and I only know how to do that. Right. So make sure, you know, because you got to eat, you know, have a have a backup plan or something. Particularly in the way that things are just evolving right now, as you mentioned earlier, right? That, you know, performance in this industry is changing by the minute. So uh, that's a yeah. really, really great piece of advice for us to end on in terms of have a backup plan, but don't be afraid of no. Right. Uh, Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your insights and sharing your experiences with us and talking to us about what you see the future of theater becoming. It's really always such a pleasure for me to talk to you because I feel like I'm, I'm learning and growing just in this moment, just from hearing your wise words of wisdom. So thank, thank you. you so much. And thank you for the work you're doing, you know, at such a young age, how you're exposing all these writers. I think it's just wonderful. And you, should share, you should share your website with people in your festival. Yes, absolutely. The Kampala International Theatre Festival website. It's basically just kampalainternationaltheaterfestival.com um, and you can check it out on our pages as well. So um, thank you so much again for your thank time. You. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Those of you that are out there in the audience. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And I'd like to also say a special thank you to our ASL interpreters, Barry and Rory, mm -hmm. for um, yeah, taking you know this whole conversation and making it more accessible to our audiences. Um, and again, you know, it's the wrap for this season, but hopefully we'll be back soon with some more um, insights and more conversations with uh, women across the African continent and in the diaspora about their creative practices. So thank you all so much for tuning in and for being supporters. And yeah, looking forward to seeing you soon, hopefully um, on this platform again. And thank you, HowlRound, for consistently supporting us. Oh, yes. Thanks to HowlRound. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Take care, everybody.